Okay. So, uh, games people play. Um, we've seen this idea of the inverse, right? So for the inverse, we know this, and we know this, if the inverse exists. So one question is, is um, suppose we know that uh, we have a matrix A, and we can find B that this is true. Does this by itself mean that B is the inverse, or do I have to go both ways and show that this is true as well? And fortunately, no. This basically, if you can show this, you're essentially done. And so let's see. So let's play this game. We're going to say suppose A has an inverse. Okay. And I'm going to say uh, suppose I find a matrix A times B is that. Does that mean B is the inverse? And that's equivalent to saying is this true? If this is true and this is true, then that means B is the inverse. So what's the game? So we're going to assume A times B is equal to I. <coughs> okay. That means what? That means that if I take if I can give it any, or any vector b, if I take a times b times that vector, a times b is i, so that's the same thing as taking i times b, but i times b is just going to be b. Now, the key thing in my argument here is that I basically said this is true for any b. So if I look at this, if I change the order of operations, I take b times this, this is just some vector x. So this is saying ax equals b. So what did I just say? I just said that given any b, I can find an x, and x is going to be b times that b, where ax equals b. So this is always has a solution. So a is onto. And, be, that's, and because it's an n by n matrix, that means a inverse exists. So let's go back to here. So we know that AB equals I. If I multiply both sides by A inverse, then A inverse times I is just inverse, or just A inverse. A inverse AB is A inverse. Let me change the order that I do these operations. So I'm going to take a times a inverse before I do a times b. That's just i. So that means then that b equals a inverse. Okay. So if I can find a matrix where a, b is equal to i, if I'm given a, that means b is the inverse and I don't have to go and look at it the other way. And also vice versa is true as well. If you give me that BA equals I, I don't have to go through and show that AB is also equal to I to show that B, A, the inverse of A is B. Okay, so this is kind of a nice result. It basically just means I can stop there if I'm looking for the inverse. Um, other games you can play. If you get lucky and you notice something about a matrix, you can immediately uh, take advantage of that. So if I think of this as column one, column two, and column three. I can look at this and notice that a2 minus a1, it's going to be eight minus one is seven, three minus a minus one is four, minus five minus four is minus nine, is a3. These are not linearly independent, so that means uh, the inverse does not exist. So just by no if I'm fortunate enough to notice something or I see something that I can take advantage of, I can just do it and be done with it. Likewise, if I put this in reduced row echelon form, I see this. This is not the identity matrix. So I can immediately see say that A inverse does not exist. Okay. So uh, this idea that the Reduced row echelon form of a square matrix uh, tells me something about whether or not the inverse exists. Right? So if the inverse exists, that means if I put it in row echelon form, I can always get a solution. Right? And everything below the diagonal is going to be zero because I've got in rows and in columns. Now when I go through and I do the row operations to put this in reduced row echelon form, I can zero out everything above 
and I can get the identity matrix there. Okay, so I can take advantage of that. Uh, how can I do that? So suppose I have um, uh, an invertible transformation T, and T I can think of T of X is A times X, and this is the matrix associated with it. That means if I solve T of X1 equals E1, T of X2 equals E2, and, and on down, I can figure out what the inverse is. Why is that? So the thing to notice here is if so if I have t of x1 is equal to e1, if I compose both sides with s, then s of t, since it's the inverse, is just going to be x1. So if I tell you this, if I can solve that system, that's the same thing as saying that. If I can solve that system, it's the same thing as saying that on down, then s of e1 is x1, s of e2 is x2, then if I look at the matrix B associated with s, the first column of B is going to be, is going to be x1, the second column of B, sorry, it's equal, it's going to be x2, third column is x3, on to xn. Okay, so that gives me another powerful tool. And this is this idea. Suppose I want to solve uh, AX1 equals E1. I can put this in uh, an augmented matrix, and I can put this in reduced row echelon form to solve for it. And if I do that, I'll get this. This will be the vector X1 that solves AX1 equals E1. I can now do that with E2. So this is going to be E2, and I'm solving AX2 equals E2. So if I put this in reduced row echelon form, this is now going to be the vector X2. And I keep doing that. So I'm basically what I'm doing is I'm solving X1 equals E1, AX2 equals E2, AX3 equals E3 all the way down. So AXN equals EN. X1 is going to be the first column of the inverse of A. X2 is going to be the second column of the inverse of A. X3 is going to be the third column of the inverse of A all the way down. So if I want to form the inverse of A, I'm just going to use the first column as X1, second column as X2, on down. So what does this mean? This means if I form an augmented matrix, this is going to be E1, this is going to be E2, E3. So this is a little different than what we've seen before. So if I just ignore this, I will and do the uh, put this in reduced row echelon form, I'll get X1 here. If I just ignore all this, I'm going to get X2 here after I'm all done, all the way down. I know in advance, because this is invertible, that I'm going to have a pivot in every row. So if I put this in reduced row echelon form, this whole thing is going to be IN. If I do that, this column is going to be X1, this column is going to be X2, X3, on over. And taken all together, this whole matrix right here is the inverse of the original matrix, which was in here. All right, let's look at an example of this. Suppose I have this matrix here. Suppose this is my A. I want to know, does the inverse exist? Well, I can tell immediately, since it's 2 by 2, these two vectors are linearly independent. I cannot write 1, 1 in terms of 2, 3. And since there's only two of them, I'm done. So what is the actual inverse? So let's do this. Let's take my matrix A. I would like to know uh, a times x1 is equal to e1, which is going to be 1, 0. And ax2 is going to be e2, which is 0, 1. Now I'm going to put this augmented matrix in reduced row echelon form. So there's my pivot. I want to get a 0 there. So I'm going to take r2 minus r1. 
I'm going to leave the top row alone. And I'm going to go across the whole second row. 1 minus 1 is 0. 3 minus 2 is 1. 0 minus 1 is minus 1. 1 minus 0 is 1. Now I go to the second row. This is my new pivot. And I want to get a 0 in every row above it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take row 1 and I'm going to subtract 2 times row 2 because 2 minus 2 times 1 will be 0. So let's see. So I'm going to leave the bottom row alone. So I'm going to have 1 minus 2 times 0, 2 minus 2 times 1. And let's see. So this is going to be, be careful here. This is 1 minus 2 times minus 1. So that's going to give me a 3. This is going to be 0 minus 2 times 1 is minus 2. This matrix here now is my inverse. Let's check that. And I only need to do one multiplication here from our previous result. So if I take A times this new vector, or sorry, this new matrix, if I get the identity matrix, I'm done. So let's see, so I'm going to have 1 times 3 is 3, plus 2 times minus 1 is minus 2. And then for this entry, I'm going to have minus 2 plus 2. And then here I'm going to have 3 plus 3 times minus 1. And then finally here I'm going to have minus 2 plus 3 times 1. So 3 minus 2 is 1, minus 2 plus 2, 3 plus minus 3, minus 2 plus 3, and I get the identity matrix. And that indeed means that this is the inverse of my original matrix.